I'm going to do is I'm going to finish discussing the psychedelic agents and I'm going to talk about the miscellaneous agents. I'm going to kind of skip over the anticholinergics uh, just because I've ta I, I, I more or less talked about the relevant chemical structure of the anticholinergics um, in, uh, the, in the prior videos uh, when I talked about the, the three general classes, the, the serotonergics, the anticholinergics, and then the, uh, the miscellaneous uh, agents. So um, they're there. I've already kind of covered the, the basic uh, medicinal chemistry or the chemical structure of those substances, the atropine, the scopolamine, the hyoscomine. Um, so you can reference uh, earlier videos if you need to on those. So what I want to talk about today, I want to talk about uh, a very different class of substances, a kind of miscellaneous. Um, they work on a very different receptor they are not, uh, they don't work on, um, they're not serotonergic. Uh, that is to say that they don't act as ligands for the serotonin receptors, the, uh, the 5-HT receptors um, of, of, of notable importance being the uh, 2A uh, receptor when talking about the uh, serotonergic uh, type um, uh, psychedelics. These agents actually um, interact with another kind of receptor, what is known as an NMDA receptor, of which um, the primary excitatory molecule in the in the central nervous system, glutamate, um, uh, is as is, is a ligand. So glutamate can actually um, act as a ligand to the NMDA receptors. I believe the NMDA receptors are um, ionotropic; they are uh, ligand-gated ion channels. And these uh, classes, this, this, these substances um, include uh, phencyclidine or PCP uh, or, or ketamine, um, which is sometimes known as Special K out on the, on the, on the street, or that is a street name um, that's used. These two agents um, have a similar, uh, they're very similar in their chemical structure and they're similar in their pharmacological um, actions as well as both their pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. They um, act as non-competitive antagonists um, to the NMDA receptors. And as I understand, they don't bind, they don't have exactly the same binding sites. Um, and I believe that they have allosteric binding. Um, they are not direct um, antagonists. They bind and they prevent um, other, uh, the, other ligands from binding, but they don't actually bind at the active site. Um, so the, all right, so the uh, first of the uh, two agents I want to discuss is uh, the uh, phencyclidine, or PCP. This is uh, sometimes referred to as angel dust. And PCP is an interesting. Um, it uh, has this aromatic ring here, and then it has these two um, cyclohexane-like rings. Obviously, this is not because there's a nitrogen here, but this is a 5 five carbon uh, or a six carbon ring, excuse me, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a hexane, uh, which is uh, in a circular arrangement. So cyclohexane, it's all single covalent bonds, um, all single covalent bonds, and whereas the aromatic ring has, uh, of course, a reson resonance and alternating double and single bonds, even though we know that the, the electron density is more or less delocalized and spread throughout the atoms. So this is PCP or phencyclidine. This was novel, um, produced in the 1950s. It was initially used as a um, anesthetic agent, and it had really interesting properties. It, it pr helped pre it preserved airway reflexes. So you know people were given this, and they didn't necessarily stop breathing, didn't necessarily have muscle complete muscle relaxation. So you were able to have some preservation or protective reflexes, but they soon found that the problem with this was uh, is that the patients, as they were coming out of um, this, uh, they would have what's called an emergence reaction where they'd come out and they'd have hallucinations and they, they would be dissociated, they'd become very violent, they would be more or less insensitive to pain, so it would be very hard to control the, the violent, aggressive behavior that they'd sometimes have, and that's... Um, what we can see in people that use this um, illicitly or use this um, as a substance of abuse or use recreationally is they, they can have um, very, very aggressive behaviors. They can be insensitive to pain, um, which means that the, the traditional techniques that are sometimes used to, to get somebody to comply, you know, tackling them down, trying to handcuff them, uh, pressure points, the, 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 the typical kind of stuff that 
that you know police officers and people use to control these people, the people on fencyclidine may not react to that. They may be quite insensitive to pain, um, and they may not be aware of even, they may even have very severe injuries that they're not even aware of. Um, so fencyclidine was quickly taken off the market, and it is st still used in some instances as an animal um, a, a, a tranquilizer and anesthetic for animals, but um, not, not human use. Um, so that is fencyclidine. And then in the early 1960s, um, a derivative of that was produced. So here I have my uh, kind of a cyclohexane ring here um, with a carbonyl. I have a double bond to an oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and a methyl group. I have my aromatic ring, and then I have a chlorine atom right here um, attached to the aromatic ring. And this molecule here, let me pull this out a little bit. This is a molecule called ketamine. Some people call this uh, special K. Um, ketamine is very similar to fencyclidine. It's, it's actually in, in, in the same general class. Uh, and it has the same general mechanism of action is it is a non-competitive um, antagonist at NMDA receptors um, in addition to some other minor actions as far as um, uh, certain ion channels, and it does, um, and it can interact with some of the um, the opioid receptors in addition to the sigma receptors, um, which becomes relevant when we talk about the the pharmacology of ketamine. Um, ketamine is is a lot like a fencyclidine. You give it to patients, it preserves their airway reflexes. Um, they can still breathe. They can still protect uh, their airway. Um, it does not cause um, depression, overall depression, like a lot of the anesthetic agents do. In fact, you can actually see some, some catecholamine release in response to uh, ketamine, so you may see an increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure, which may be desirable when you're taking a patient to surgery. You may want to give them ketamine to help augment their blood pressure, depending on what's going on with them. Um, ketamine, like Fencyclidine is associated with an emergence reaction in people as they come out uh, from uh, an anesthetic procedure from ketamine. As they come out from the uh, under uh, influence of that, they may have some hallucinations and may have some um, some behavioral issues somewhere around 10, 10, 12, 13 percent of patients. But generally, uh, the emergence reactions can be attenuated with benzodiazepines and, and placing the patient in a quiet room, recovering them. I've had pretty pretty good good experiences uh, working in the ER. Uh, occasionally we'd have uh, patients with or orthopedic issues, they'd have uh, dislocations or fractures that we'd reduce in the emergency room, we give them ketamine, uh, and, and more or less they did, uh, they did real well. Um, I think I had one or two patients that had just some some real minor emergence issues, but we had given, we had premedicated the benzodiazepine, so it really wasn't a big issue. Um, of course, ketamine is commonly is common commonly used in rapid sequence intubation as well um, for its its properties. Um, ketamine is uh, a, an agent of abuse, however, and um, some people uh, what they what they try to do is they'll do what's called a K hole. They'll go into a K hole, and what K hole means is that's a a unique property of ketamine and and, and fencyclidine as well is where you have complete dissociation. Um, and the best way that I can kind of describe dissociation is your conscious mind is kind of dissociated from your body. You have the separation. And so you can have a patient that, that they can actually be awake. They will respond to you. You'll ask them to do something. They'll do it. And they, they, they appear to be awake. They appear to interact with you to some extent. But their personality, their, the, the, the human being, if you will, um, the 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 um, all the special programming quote unquote that makes a person a person is not there, and you kind of have this default program that can do basic things left over, but um, nobody is there. The person isn't there. The personality isn't there. So it's kind of like a lights are on, but but nobody's home um, type of uh, situation. And some people. Um, actually try to get themselves into that situation uh, when used recreational. They try to go into this, this K-hole, this dissociated state. Um, in addition to that, uh, ket like I said, ketamine can interact with some of the opioid and sigma receptors. So uh, ketamine is interesting in that it causes analgesia as well as um, anesthesia. It can cause a, both 
um, cause loss of consciousness. It can cause uh, dissociation, dissociative anesthesia, and it um, acts as an analgesic. So it has multiple things it can do. Um, and there does seem to be some evidence that ketamine may have other uh, therapeutic benefits. Ketamine is actually not a Schedule One agent. It's actually used, it's a Schedule Two, I believe, and it does have accepted medical uses uh, for mainly for airway management anesthesia. But we're now seeing that ketamine may have um, a role in things like uh, managing depression and chronic pain and, and, and possibly even substance abuse. Um, you know, putting people in ketamine comas while they while they go through withdrawal, um, using ketamine uh, as a part of uh, or an adjunct to uh, treating major depressive disorders and uh, and chronic pain syndromes as well. So it appears ketamine does have some uh, medicinal use, as do a lot of the psychedelics in general. There, even the ones that are Schedule One, there appear to be lots of medicinal uses that are potentially out there. There's a lot of active research going on right now, um, which is just fascinating because um, when I was just first going into college, um, I was what, uh, I think it was 19 um, when I first was going into college, um, there really wasn't a whole lot going on. I think there were, there, there, at that time there was um, um, some DMT research that was going on at the University of New Mexico. Um, but nothing real serious. And then in the last 20 years, the, the research into psychedelics has just kind of um, really exploded. And um, it's, it'll be really interesting to see how things go. Okay, guys, I think I'm going to cut it off here. Um, I'm going to try to get some videos up later on um, stimulants, primarily talking about cocaine. I've already done a video, I think it was about a year or so ago, on amphetamines and methamphetamines. Um, so I don't really feel a need to do another one um, because I did actually cover the the, um, the chemistry, the chemical structure of the amphetamines um, in, in, in a fair amount of detail um, in that video. And so maybe I'll just throw that video into this playlist uh, for the, the sake of completion. Okay, guys, as always, thanks for hanging in there, everybody.